If you are thinking of a bank that takes care of customers' needs, buy. If you are thinking of a bank that takes care of customers' needs by providing quality services with flexibility, reliability, and innovation, think Trust Bank Limited. With Trust Bank Limited Mobile Banking, you enjoy services such as balance inquiry, mini statement, funds transfer between accounts, exchange rates, mobile airtime top up, stop ATM card, checkbook request, and pin change. Our real-time gross settlement allows the customer to instruct the bank to transfer funds from their account to another account at another bank. Our expertise and experience in international banking is both legendary and the envy of the market. Retail banking, one bank, different amazing packages. Whether you are interested in savings account, current account, time or fixed deposit account, lending or overdraft, our team of dedicated staff is always ready and willing to help you out with your transactions as you wish. Corporate Banking Trust Bank Limited offer the most convenient services for deposit accounts, credit facilities, trade finance, bond and guarantee and foreign currency account. With e-banking, you can make electronic bill payments and online banking and enjoy 24-hour access to your cash with our ATM. With the largest network of branches and agents, we give you the convenience to receive funds as you please. Trust Bank Limited, proudly Gambian. Fay lempo warugal la si kepo ko hamne domi reo minga ak nyufi deke. Bo feke ne chi at mi sa kom kom we su na nyar fuka ak nyenti june dalasi. Mbete wer buneka dinga am luto lo si nyari june dalasi. Lempo silangurgi di sukande ku ngi lige yoku te reo mi. GRA moy banghas bunguri gambia sas ngi rumu feye ku lepo lui lempo chi bi reo mi. Betak na GRA di yegal fey kati lempo ine warugal la pur nyu fey lunyu nan withholding tax on contract payment. Ma nam bepa contract bu way joxe te ci bi rew mi lañu tokkon xali ci contract bi ngeen nangoto war nga ci wañi ci xayma témer bu neka fuka bu féké na contract bi dekku ci bi rew mi bu boba di nga waro wañi témer bu neka fuka ak jurom li moy lempo buñu nan with holding tax on contract payment li moy lempo bi nga xamné yow mi joxe contract waru gal la nga wol batiku dem fey ko ci makani diaré tax office bu la gëna jégé mbété ci banki diaré jagléel pour fey lempo war nga djébal lempo bi ci diri fuki fan ak jurom ganaw bi nga wagné ci xali ci contract bi amut ben contracto bu ñu téggel fey lempo bi xana mu fekk né nguri gambia ñoko djégalé bolé ci project yi nga xamné mbotaay ndimbali ñokoy dépense jra di fey ku lempo ngir yok for the first time in the history of the gambia gambia printing publishing corporation proudly introduces the billiomatic exercise book printing machine the machine has the capacity to print more than 20,000 books per hour. Yes, 20,000 books per hour. It also prints magazines, newspapers, calendars, flyers, normal books and all kinds of printed documents plus items at affordable prices. With the Bilomatic printing machine, GPPC can now render high quality and non-size restricted printing service supply across the sub-region. Rush now and partner with GPPC for all your public and private printing service needs. Print with us today and you'd be offered highly professional, reliable and efficient service delivery by our team of experts. 
The Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation is here to meet all demands and is reliable at all times. For more info, contact us on 437-4493 or 437-4402. GPPC is Gambian and it's yours. Communication, connectivity is everything. We ensure that the links never sleep. Quantities and qualities, all in our data service, providing efficient, reliable voice and data service. We believe if you're not up to speed, then you're going backwards. Communications have to flow as fast as the speed of light. Whatever business you're in, having someone who understands your needs is critical. That is why we just don't offer you technology, we offer you solutions. Enjoy Gumsel's internet broadband anytime, anywhere. Your national operator, Gumsel. Hello and welcome to season five. Uh, it's been a while. We've been away since last year um, and I'm glad to be here. Oli was supposed to be here actually, but he's running um, late and that's why we're also running late on the show. We want to welcome you all back on Kefatu. And we are going to start going live because it's election period. But after the election, we'll go back to our normal program, which is 9 o'clock. I want to welcome you all, wherever you're watching us. And today, uh, we're saying road to the parliament. If you've been following us, we did road to state house. And after that, um, we had a season break. And But we, uh, with me today is uh, Esa Njai. Esa is going to be my co-guest uh, host. Um, Esa, welcome to Kirfato. Thank you for having me. And of course, uh, our guest for tonight's show is uh, Mr. Pakan. Pa is the um, spokesperson for the IEC. It's election period. Everybody wants to know what's going on. Pa, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I must tell my people, you, you, you actually, you're a new lead, no? First and foremost, Pa, uh, we want to check um, the state of preparedness. It's election. Um, we did the December election. Things went well. Everything. Um, I mean, I mean, every so many people. Other people have issues, but generally, the coordination, especially, um, went well. What is the level of preparedness for the national assembly elections that we we're, we're going to get into in a couple of days? Yes. Thank you very much, Pato. I would say the level of preparedness is very high at this moment. I can even read it at uh, ninety percent. We are almost 90% done with the preparations uh, because once we completed the president's election in 2021, we started work in earnest on the national assembly elections, which is uh, to be held, which are to be held. These are elections, of course, which are to be held on the 9th of April 2021, and this started with the uh, uh, stakeholder consultations. Of course, IEC, you know, always tries to engage with stakeholders as much as possible so that to bring all stakeholders on the same page. I think this is key in any electoral exercise to, to ensure success. You must engage your stakeholders very well so that they can be uh, okay with the issues, you know, they can uh, be at par with your, your level of preparations and in case there are any challenges, you know, they can be involved in the process. Just to say it's an all-inclusive process because we always say uh, that elections is the business of all. So every hand is supposed to be on deck, uh, so that uh, the process works out very well. So right now uh, we just concluded. Uh, apart from the stakeholder consultation, of course, which are of course ongoing, we also have uh, training programs that we did uh, for some of the stakeholders, including the police, uh, the political parties, uh, the CSUs, uh, the media. So we had a lot of engagements with all of those stakeholders. Uh, as to training them so that they can be okay with uh, the issues uh, come the uh, National Assembly elections in April on the 9th. And uh, we also had our own training. That's the training uh, for the polling staff. These are the polling officials at supervisory level. Of course, you have different stages, different tires in the process. So we had training uh, for the AROs. These are the assistant driving officers. 
they are in charge of the various constituencies. So we had a training uh, of about 150 of them. Uh, about 200 people were engaged in this training and they were all trained on the process. Uh, I would say for most of them, this is a refresher course because it's, it's the same program for 2021, the presidential election. And of course, it's dealing with the same laws again because we, uh, most of the time we uh, focus more on the Elections Act and the Constitution of the Gambia. So for the National Assembly elections, these are the key instruments that we use uh, in this process. And again, I would say, aside from the training again, uh, we've been also uh, uh, conducting procurements. I think we are almost done now. Procurements have concluded. Uh, right now, we are on the dispatch of these proc uh, procured materials. Uh, just uh, today, I think we have a delivery of our T-shirts. Uh, of course, that's my domain, voter education. So we, we've received about 10,000 T-shirts uh, for now, which we would pretty soon disburse uh, or distribute to the public, just to inform them about the process. Because elections need publicity. Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, uh, maybe Mr. Jai may agree with me, in political science, this is the uh, one of the mass uh, uh, mass um, mobilization uh, in peacetime and that's election where every stakeholder is involved almost every citizen is involved uh, directly or indirectly so the people should be aware of the processes so this is key that uh, we educate the voters on the process this Kefan so I would say is one of them I have to be here even though you have to drag me here <laughs> I have to be here because it's part of voter education so that we uh, update the public we inform voters you know, what, uh, uh, what uh, is expected and also uh, if there are, we are any uh, challenges in the past, how do we resolve those challenges? So I would say we are at a very high level of preparation. And again, in terms of uh, the deployment, uh, right now I think all the materials, uh, all the equipment are already in place and now the materials are left. I, I would say we have a greater part of those materials and the, uh, the deployment is ongoing, I'm sure pretty soon we'll, we'll conclude. And once this is done, then we are ready for E-Day. We call it E-Day, Election Day, which will be on the 9th. It is on the 9th. Esther, so generally, um, presidential elections, you see a lot of movement, you see a lot of noise, you see a lot of ambience, but it's different from the National Assembly. Let's look at the role of the parliamentarian. It's important. Um, he was talking about voter education. I don't see a lot of it. Um, I don't know wha what he, he's talking about. What they're doing, I don't see a lot of it. Mm. Even the civic, um, how, how, what are they called? NCC. The yeah. NCCA. Yeah. I, I don't see a lot of voter education as well. Uh, do we even know the role of these parliamentarians? Why are people not really uh, involved in the election of parliamentarians? The role of the parliament is important. Well. Interesting question. Um, <coughs> I don't know where to start, but then <laughs> first I would say maybe probably Gambians are kind of disillusioned with politics. Um, you know, a lot has happened in the past five years um, since the, the removal of um, Yaya Janda from power in 2015. And coming to the December 2021 elections, we saw a lot of um, participation from, from, from Gambians. Um, people were so eager I mean, willing to participate in elections, and we saw that a lot of people exercise their constitutional right. And if you can correct me, I think we had up to close to 90 percent voter turnout. 89 percent. 89 percent voter turnout, which was impressive. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's the first time in the history. Un unprecedented. 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 Which was so unprecedented, and it tells a lot that people um, are really interested in participating in the governance process of, of, of the Gambia. Um, but in coming to the um, this year's election, I was also you know, wondering why people are not that active. We yeah. are not seeing that much participation. Why do you think so? Even, even it's on the different though, because when it comes to representation, people who want to partake, like we have over 251, about 251 yeah. 251, candidates. Yeah, candidates. Even, even though now we had uh, three, oh, three withdrawals. Three withdrawals. Mm -hmm. three withdrawals. But around that, 250 around that, or 248, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Never happened. I don't think it's ever happened in this country. How, what was the number in 2017? 
I'm not yeah. quite sure. Yeah. But it's not, like not up to that. Not maybe up half. Not up maybe half, half of this. Yeah, maybe half. But we see that people want to partake. People want to represent us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But us, the masses, why do you think well, yeah, people not are not interested so the, 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 the I mean, it's just a couple of months ago when yeah, we had the presidential. Exactly. It's not only the electorate that are relaxed. And you made mention of civil society and all that. But even media. I have not seen yeah. much of you know these elections being talked about on the media. No. I've not seen it. Yeah. The other time I wanted to say like, okay, what's happening? Even Kirfatu, yeah. <laughs> nothing I mean, is being said. Yes, just two weeks to election. Exactly. So, yeah. so it, it comes to beg the question: um, Are people kind of disillusioned with politics? That is one. But also, I think. I mean, this is this is not the first time. Mm -hmm. Normally, the turnout is good for president Yes. But parliamentary election, the turnout is you know normally not good. It's either because some. I feel there are two things. Either because. Um, the electorates, um, some might be disillusioned in the sense that their candidate did not win the presidential election, and now they feel like, oh, I'm not participating. It's a done deal. The incumbent is just going to win. But sometimes also I feel like um, people do not also understand um, the essence of National Assembly election, the importance of National Assembly. I've always said this. I've always said it, and I still maintain. For me, parliament is the most important organ of government. Mm. There are three arms of government the executive, legislature, and judiciary, and they tell us that the media is the fourth estate. Mm -hmm. But among these three arms, we know they have separate roles. Yes. The, 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 the parliament make laws, the executive implement laws, and the judiciary interpret laws. But if the executive cannot implement laws, then parliament does not make laws. For laws to be implemented, they must be made. Yes. For laws to be interpreted, they must be made. So it is the parliament that is responsible for making laws. And therefore, I consider it the most important organ, not only lawmaking, but parliament is also responsible for holding. ratifying, holding acc Government. politicians to account, account executive, yeah. Yeah. but also ratifying you know, loan agreements that the Gambia might be entered into, yeah. ratifying international treaties. But also, they are responsible for approving budget, how much goes into education, how much goes into healthcare, how much goes, goes into agriculture, all these different sectors. Parliament is responsible for, for approving or disapproving. Do you understand? So people must understand the role of parliamentarians. But also, it's not only the electorate to understand. Even the aspirants must also understand their role. Mm. Because a lot of people, I mean, I see I've, people I've always saying, said this. I build a bridge. I've in, said this. In my area, I've always so you said this. Vote for me. I've said this on the media, <laughs> in other platforms, and I'm going to repeat it. Yeah. That I fear, I fear that we might have the worst parliament. Why? If you are not mindful. Why? Looking at the caliber of candidates that most of these parties are presenting, I'm not um, kind of belittling or downgrading anyone, but I think the caliber of candidates that most of these parties are presenting, knowing the mindset of the electorate, they just care about who is winnable, a winnable candidate, somebody that they think can really get the voters, can really get to parliament. Whether the person is competent or not, they don't care. What they want is somebody to represent them. They want seats in parliament. That is what the parties are after. So at the end of the day, most of these aspirants don't also understand their roles and responsibilities. You come as an aspirant, you tell me that I'm going to build a health center for you, bridge and road and here and there. But that is not your, your primary role. Your primary role is lawmaking. Mm. And I feel, Gambia, the stage that we are right now, parliamentarians, aspirants have, a, have, have something to campaign on if they're really serious about what they want to do. One, we know that the past five years, I've always said, has been a waste for me as far as our reforms are concerned. Now, what do we do to make sure that the reforms are brought back to life? And there are key points here that parliamentarians can focus on when it comes to this election. One, we know that we don't have a new constitution. It is a shame that we voted in 2021 election using the 1997 constitution. It is a shame that President Barrow was sworn in in January 2022 using the 1997 constitution. It's a shame that we voted in 2021 using the old electoral law. Okay, So we are going to 2022 National Assembly election, the second parliamentary election after Yajame left this country. We are still using the Yajame law that we all cried and said they are bad. Okay. Now, what is the essence of removing Yajame? Only because he was killing, right? Mm. So we should have maintained him then, if it is about the laws. So the parliamentarians that are coming, the biggest task they have ahead of them, that is why I quite agree with Honorable Salah, his um, you know, last speech in parliament, when he said that they have passed a lot of bills, but they could have passed more. Okay? And I think the next target, mm -hmm. the next step for parliamentarians, those that are going to parliament should be, when they are campaigning to their people, their electorate, what they should tell them, one, when I go to parliament, I, what are you going to do to make sure that we have a new constitution in place? 
to make sure that we have a third republic because we're still in the second republic, which is a shame. Okay, to make sure that a third republic is ushered in, that is a new constitution is put in place, that is not only going to respect the fundamental rights and liberties of Gambians, but also going to make sure that there is accountability and democratic process is hold. Now, not only that, but also looking at the electoral law. What are you going to do to make sure that there is a new electoral law in place? That a lot of people complain about Alcalo attestation, it's still in our electoral law. What are you going to do to make sure that this thing is out? What are you going to do to make sure that corruption, corruption is addressed in this country by coming up with laws? And the anti-corruption bill is still falling in parliament. What are you going to do as a parliamentarian to make sure that this is passed? Because for me, this can be linked even to the problem of the people, the problems that people are facing in this country. Talk to the electorate. When it comes to healthcare problem, for instance, um, we know the money that will go into health. We have corruption in this country that is responsible for most of these problems. Scandal upon scandal, GPA to NAVEC to GRA, every day, GNPC, every day we'll hear scandals. We're talking about $400 million is went missing, allegedly, at the Gambia Ports Authority. Now, tell the electorate that because these, there are no laws in place that will specifically address these problems. We have challenges in the healthcare system. We have challenges in you know, agriculture and all these sectors. Because we have corruption rampant in this country, and I've always agreed that the difference between Yajame and Baro when it comes to corruption is that under Jame, corruption was centralized. It was Jame picking. But now under Baro, it is decentralized. Everybody can pick anywhere and nothing will happen. All that we know is that Gambia, as a country, has turned into a country of investigations, where when these things happen, all that they will say, investigation, investigation, and then comes. Now, as a parliamentarian, what are you going to do to make sure that there is an anti-corruption bill in place. But, but not only but that. But then if we don't have the caliber of parliamentarians, but that's what I'm saying. How can we? But that is what I'm saying. That is why I said. That is why I said most of these aspirants don't even understand their roles. But also you have to understand one thing, Fatu. They're also playing with the mindset of the people. They're dealing with people who don't even understand the role of parliamentarians. And that is why I think I don't know what the IEC is doing about that and civil society organizations, including the NCCE, to make sure that people are sensitized on the role of parliamentarians. Yeah. Let them know that primarily, the role of parliamentarians is lawmaking. Yeah. Making sure that there is proper bu budget allocation for the different sectors based on priorities. Making sure that Gambia, the loan agreements that we are signing <coughs> are scrutinized properly and make sure that there are no strings attached that, are, that is going to, you know, at, at the end of the day, strangle us. But also, to make them know that most of these things that parliamentarians are campaigning on, road, health facilities, and here and there. These are primarily the role of local I government had a, I had a, I had an aspirant who said, um, I go to, I'm going to parliament to, to, to pursue the president's agenda. That, that, shows that, that is why I said I fear for the worst parliament we have. Because, because such people, it is, really, it is really disheartening to have such people in parliament. It seems Gambians themselves are joking with their lives. People that are responsible for your... For, for your life, basically, what goes into agriculture, what goes into education of your kids, what goes into healthcare, all these critical sectors of development. We know, looking at the Gambia today, we're talking about a lot of challenges. Gambia is one of the poorest countries in Africa. Gambia remains one of the highly corrupt countries in the world. You're talking about out of 180, you're talking about, about 172 position. Do you understand? Transparency, Transparency International. We still have you know, a lot of challenges in this country when it comes to healthcare and other sectors. But then these are the people that are going to be responsible for that. How do you make sure that we have competent people in parliament? There is one thing that people always say, and I've had um, a parliamentarian complaining about it. Um, it's a parliamentarian running for the second time. I'm saying that English should not be used as a yardstick because I'm not representing the British, I'm representing Gambians. But you see, it's so disheartening. Yes, that's my auntie though. No, maybe, well, well, whether, whether your auntie or somebody. The thing is far too. Yeah, yeah. The thing is far too. People, we must be honest with, it, mm -hmm. with each other. Here is the thing. Yeah. The constitution that you're talking about, yeah. the laws, the policy documents, all the policy documents that come to parliament are written in English. They're yeah. not written in Mandinka or Wolof or Jola. Mm -hmm. So if you're not able to read and understand simple English, how do you even contribute to debate in parliament? How do you bring in your ideas? Unless and until we change our official language from English to Mandinka or Wolof or Jola or Sarahule, then we cannot say that English should not be used as a yardstick. Because there must be that level of competence in you. Today, if you go to Kenya, 
Nobody will say if you cannot if you cannot speak English, you can only speak Swahili. You will not be in Parliament. You are not competent. No, because Swahili is used as an official language. It's not a problem there. Yeah. So, but Gambia, we don't have that. It's English that we have. Unless and until we do away with English, but as long as we have it as an official language, as the medium of communication, our constitution, our laws, everything is written in English. So parliamentarians must have a basic understanding of these documents before they can contribute to debate. So they themselves must understand their roles. But because what they know is that Gambians are used to two types of politics, I always say. Politics of infrastructure, build roads and bridges and hospitals and all that, and politics of the belly. The politics of the belly comes in two forms also. There are two sets of people who benefit from this. That those that are on top always get, get in the kickbacks in terms of financial inducement. But also there are other people, these are the masses of the people who vote in elections, who are only needed when it is time for election. They go, sabar, benachin, because maybe those people sometimes it goes around a month, they don't eat benachin and meet in their houses. And they come, they just give them benachin and meet and they eat and then they vote for them, that's it. I give example of the, the president's current tour. Okay? You won elections in December, January, February, up to now. You never thought of going back to these people to show gratitude. To be grateful for what they have done for you. But then just waiting just a week before election or two weeks before election. And now you are going back to them. Electorates must be mindful of this. This is a tactic by politicians. That I only come to you when I need you. You voted for him. He came around the entire country. He went to you and said, I need your votes. You voted for him. He was not even grateful for the entire three months not to come back to you. Now because he needs you again for the National Assembly election, so that you get his people in Parliament, and he's coming to you to tell you that, oh, vote for me, I need your vote. I'm thanking you, but I also need your vote. So the, there are two things here. Parliamentarians must understand their roles, those that are aspiring. And I've seen, I'm just no, not surprised, but disappointed, that a lot of these people that you even think at least have that understanding are still peddling the same narrative, trying to go by the same style of politics, because that's what Gambians are used to. But okay. if you don't use that, you're not going to win. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. But what they're going to do is, for me, mm -hmm. if, for instance, I'm aspiring to be a parliamentarian, yeah. the primary, I'm going to lay down my primary role. This is my primary role. When it comes to development provisions here and there, mm -hmm. it is not bad for parliamentarians to lobby for development projects within their constituencies for their people and all that. It's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. They can do that. But they can always say that this is going to be done in collaboration with councillors and local government authorities, like mm -hmm. chairmen or chairpersons and also mayors and mayors. This is the primary role of mayors and mayoress and chairpersons, mm -hmm. okay? But then when it comes to parliamentarians, their primary role is lawmaking. It's to make sure that laws are scrutinized in parliament, bills are passed. There are a lot of bills, even the women, the, the constitutional amendment bill that seek to promote the participation of women in government politics. That should also be pushed at the end of the day. There are a lot of things that need reform in our laws, but these things are not done. And parliamentarians that are coming should be thinking of this. What do we do to make sure that these reforms, the national security bill, that we talk about is still, still at the Ministry of Justice. So there cannot be meaningful security sector reform when the bill that should legally operationalize the, national, the Office of National Security still lies at the Ministry of Justice. I that is why the security sector reform is not moving anywhere. Esther, I think you were missing one point. I think I'll come to Esther. When I said, um, why are people not um, excited to go back to, 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 to participate in election? Do you think the, the regulators have a part to play? I think also at some point because, you know, people, when, you, when you talk to people randomly in the streets, yeah. some will tell you that, even on social media, some will tell you that IEC is not credible. Yeah. I don't trust IEC yeah. here and there. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially the recent allegations from, from, from the UDP saying that um, there was fraud in the elections here and there, coming out with, um, in quote, evidence that this is what happened, registrations were held out, even though IEC... I mean, discredited that allegation from, from, from the UDP. But then you also understand that not only that, but like coming from 2016, the mistakes that were, the errors that were committed, um, 2016 election, 2017 parliamentary election, I think there was a particular constituency where there was a problem also. Yeah. You, you can correct me um, if yeah. I can. Mm -hmm. And then coming to the December election, everybody looking, everybody was like, I see, are they credible here and there? And now we're seeing not only UDP, but also the EU published a report to say, that you know the president's party utilizes on state resources to do campaign even though the IEC has a limited role also they have a role to play but it's also limited but you realize that it also kind of doubt the credibility of the entire electoral process so at some point people also feel like the IEC will not be able to conduct free and fair election even though they've been trying in the past trying to maintain that credibility but this is the mindset of the people too you cannot you cannot just discredit that at the end of the day it also contributes a lot 
in terms of people um, popular participation among 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 the electorate. Uh, Mr. 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 Khan, what is the IEC doing to to restore that? The I mean a section of a population. For example, when the UDP came out and said and accused the IEC of conspiring with the NPP mm. to steal the election. That was something that the IEC, I don't think they even treated it properly. Mm. They even just gave an interview to a newspaper instead of at least coming out and strongly condemning him mm. and bringing a bold statement that will assure everybody that this, whatever you are saying is wrong, is mm. not true. Mm. That would have given us more um, bold assurance from yeah. the IEC. But also the EU coming out and saying this. But again, more importantly, as the regulators, you said their role is limited. But yes, I believe it's limited because you look at who funds who funds the IEC. Mm -hmm. Most of their funding is from government, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know, development partners also chip in. But like the president is on a tour, mm -hmm. that is a mandated, constitutional mandated thing for the president to go around the country and you know talk to talk to farmers talk to, fa talk <laughs> talk to, to farmers. people talk to people talk to farmers <laughs> and i believe the president as a leader of the party has a right to go and campaign for his candidate but it should not be on state resources yeah so if the npp can come out and say the president is going on a mid the campaign tour mm -hmm. and the iec we know that it's state resources that are being used mm -hmm. and the iec as regulators i saw the jimara np um, uh, candidate Mm. send a petition to the IEC. I don't know. Mm. All of these things are coming and we are not seeing the IEC saying or doing anything about it. How credible or how, um, what, how can they assure us that they are doing their role properly as regulators to elections? Elections are very important, uh, Mr. Khan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we have to set the record straight. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, uh, somebody claims that people are not, they don't have confidence in the IEC. I think that that's misleading, quite misleading. Uh, let's just go back memory then. Mm -hmm. uh, the IEC conducted the 2016 election, even though with some you know, problems yeah. here and there. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, this was really welcomed by Gambians, yes. by the majority of Gambians. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also recently conducted the 2021 president's election with an unprecedented at uh, 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 level of turnout. Yeah. So I think it means Gambian, they have a high confidence in the IEC. Because, you know, we talk about, as actual experts, voter apathy. Maybe some of the reasons may be lack of but, but, confidence. But, 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 not to cut you, but what uh, do you say to the research uh, which reveals that the level of confidence by Gambians in the IEC has dropped uh, between 2018 to 2021? Uh, yeah, let me just come. Huh? Okay. I, I'm speaking based, based on evidence. Okay. So. Uh, we just concluded the uh, presidential election in 2021, and there was massive turnout. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the records, you know, will speak for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that uh, people really had confidence for which reason they came out in their numbers to take part in that election. So we expect the same thing to uh, to continue uh, come the uh, uh, the national assembly elections on 9th April. And again, uh, going to the issues you raised on voter education. Yeah. Mm, there is not much euphoria maybe in town. Uh, I think uh, we've seen that in 2021, uh, issues were centered in the elections house, that kind of thing. Yeah. But the, uh, for the national assembly elections, I would say activities have been dispersed across the country. So maybe you may not see that uh, number of crowds around, but I tell you that there is a lot of activities across all the regions, from Banjul up to Basse, meaning that people are participating in the process, people are supporting their candidates, and people are taking part you know, in the elections, in the campaign. And again, going out, uh, talking about on the issue of visibility, uh, I would say maybe, okay, we just on Fatu Network, right? Is it uh, Kerfatu? Huh? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I always mix the two. Huh? I know, it's okay. Okay, Kerfatu. Mm -hmm. But of course, we also on a lot of media, the IEC is doing a lot of sensitization uh, on the radio FMs, FM radios around the country. And uh, I'm sure you will see billboards all around in all the regions. So I think that's visibility that elections are, are, are coming up and people should be aware of that and then they can take part in the elections. And not only that, we're also using the TV, uh, QTV mostly and GRTS because they have a national coverage. 
so they can cover somebody from Banjul and somebody from Basi, even Kwena, or even Nyamanar, I think, which is the, the last village in the Gambia. So I would say the commission is doing a lot in, in that aspect, making sure that the Gambians are aware of uh, these elections, uh, they are upcoming, and then they have a role to play. So uh, I would use the election lens, huh? not my prof, who is using the political science lens, <laughs> that at the interest as uh, election experts, mm -hmm. our interest is uh, to conduct elections, to give choice to people. Yeah. We don't mind who wins. That's not our interest. Your interest is free fair. Our interest is to conduct elections, making sure that people, uh, people, um, uh, uh, people have their political rights, uh, they have the right to choose whosoever they want. They want. That's yeah. from, from our own point of view. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we don't matter. It doesn't matter who, mm -hmm. who, who is chosen or, or who wins the election. Mm -hmm. So, I think that has to be made clear that people have the right, uh, political rights, to vote and to be voted for. Yeah. So, they have these two options. So, if they choose ESA or FATU or somebody else, that's their choice. No mm -hmm. doubt It's the law. And, of course, they are the sovereign, huh? the power belongs to them. So it's only them who can say, who represents them in, in, uh, in the executive, uh, in the uh, legislature, or even in local government. So we're not much interested in that. So let people have a choice and then let them vote in free and transparent elections, free, fair, and transparent elections. That's our interest, and that's our focus in this case. So, but, but, but I, 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 I quite dis I disagree um, when he said, um, the turnout, because it seems like he's drawing um, kind of a nexus between the turnout in the 2021 elections um, and confidence in the IEC. I would say it is not because people had much confidence in the IEC and that is why they came out in their numbers to vote. I think Gambia, it is the other case, you know, it is the other way around. Gambians went into the December election with a lot of doubts. See, a candidate was rejected. And he decided to go to court. The court declared that, oh, give him opportunity to, con um, to, to fill in final nominations, meaning the IEC was wrong in this decision, right? GMC candidate was also rejected. So people, all these p the problems compounded, created that lack of confidence. Okay? And then a, note, a survey was conducted. A survey was conducted. 2018, the level of confidence in the IEC, um, it was conducted by Afrobarometer, if I am correct. The level of confidence in the IEC in 2018 dropped significantly compared to 2021. So it shows that Gambians went into the election with doubt. I think what increased the level of participation was because, one, it was the first post-presidential election after a dictatorship, a 22 years of dictatorship. And Gambians felt that the political space was so liberalized, was open, and people can participate in elections without fear without having in mind that, okay, uh, if I participate and vote for the opposition or vote for this, I might be victimized. So compared to Jami era, where people concluded that, oh, you know what, Jami will be in elections. Now it's a different space. The political space is liberalized. People have their rights and liberties being guaranteed. And people feel like I can even vote against the incumbent and nothing will happen. So people had that confidence to say at some point, if they participate in elections, they can, you know, they, they can defeat the incumbent. And some felt like, oh, if we participate in the election, vote for the incumbent, he can win. So I think the level of participation, the high level of participation, the unprecedented participation, is not due to the confidence in the IEC. I feel it is because of the political space. Because in dictatorships, election, political space can be so tight that people find it difficult to participate. Okay? But in, in a liberalized political space, you tend to have, you know, increased participation of people. So I feel that the 2021 election was because it was the first post-dictatorship presidential election after Jami left this country. Mm -hmm. And everybody feel like, it's just like um, what my Ninkas will say, near Bar City, Bumokono. All of a sudden, near Bundai, Dorong. So everybody mm -hmm. was excited, yeah, Jami is no more here, we are voting for the first time, especially the first time voters. Mm -hmm. They are voting in the um, in presidential election without any pressure. So I think that this was responsive. That's my own thing, but I don't think it was because of the confidence but in the IEC. But would you say that the IEC did well in the voter registration, though? I think because for the first time we're able to register that much number of people. That, that's that's what I'm saying. I think the, the when but it then comes to the, the, but then the other people will tell you how do we even trust that because that's what UDP is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see, you right. see, I'm not so. I'm not necessarily doubting mm -hmm. the credibility of the IEC. Okay. That I'm not giving my personal view or perspective. Yeah, but yeah. but I'm trying to say what people. 
thing out there. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the 20, 2016 election, like he said, it was, it was just, I mean, unprecedented. How IEC was able to even muster, be the, that, muster the courage to declare an election results yeah. that saw the defeat of an incumbent that who said he was going to rule the Gambia for one billion years, if I last year so. Now, coming to the 2021 election, so they, they did a lot. You know, tremendous achievements have been registered, even though there were setbacks here and there, especially when it comes to finance issue. I am aware that IEC is always at loggerheads with parliamentarians. When they go there, uh, parliamentarians will task them to conduct, you know, free election to make sure that everything is done. But they always tell them that when we come here, you cut our budget. So, but they, so they had those challenges, but they tried. They tried a lot. Coming from the past in 22 years, coming to the 2021 election, a lot of achievements have been registered. But setbacks have been there. But also, this is what people feel. You talk to some people out there, they'll be like, I'm IEC, I don't trust them. That is what they think. Not what SNJI thinks, but that yeah, is what they think. Cool. And I don't want people to associate the high voter turnout in 2021 True. to the IEC, certainly before the election. We saw that. The level of confidence dropped. Research has shown that. But also people talking in town saying that, oh, the IEC made this. They rejected CA candidate. They rejected this. They went to court and the court declared this and that and that. And people start doubting the IEC. Are they even having good legal advisor who is advising them legally here and there? So those, those kind of, um, that, that mindset, people went into the election with that doubt about the credibility of the IEC. But not that. The commission was not doing a job. They were doing a good job. But that's, that's, that's the mindset of the people, and you can't do anything about that, as long as they are not confident with what is happening. Uh, yes, maybe if we're saying the people, the people, mm -hmm. who are the people, and who are those people? <laughs> the so, Gambians. So, <laughs> which Gambians? Huh? So I, would take I see a lot uh, of them right now on my comments. Uh, yes, very well. <laughs> I, I, I believe when we say the people, uh, we have to be able to uh, 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 say, say how many of them. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, this can be 1% or 5% mm -hmm. uh, making all the noise. So no, this, no. The, this, research, the this, research shows the research shows that a significant this, drop. This wouldn't discredit. I think forty nine percent. If my if my mind can serve me. This can in no way discredit the facts because we have the facts at hand. Hmm. And again, you know, you saying about uh, uh, survey opinion polls. Sometimes you wonder how credible they can be, yeah. because when a survey or an opinion poll is saying people have the people have no confidence, the people have no confidence uh, in, in the system. And again, we're seeing the people coming out up to almost 90 percent i think this is you know th th these are conflicting no no i don't, I don't think i don't think they are okay. conflicting mr khan i don't think they are conflicting people having low confidence and people coming out to participate doesn't mean that there is conflict here are two different things i might not have confidence in fatu mm -hmm. what fatu is doing yeah. but i can still join fatu to do something with her yeah. because i don't know i believe maybe things will change yeah. Do you understand? I might not have confidence in Kerfatu, yeah. but I can still come and be part of Kerfatu and be working with Kerfatu. I see people watching us and Kerfatu Exactly, they don't even like it. But they still watch. Do you understand? Yeah. So for me, the survey that you're talking about, these are scientific surveys that are being done and specific methodologies are being used. Do you understand? These are not opinion polls. And when we say the people, we, we say the people are the Gambians. I don't want to use the STD people. STD is some of the people. The people. The people. <laughs> Who are the people? What is the Gambians? The majority of Gambians. Survey says. Survey says majority of Gambians who are being interviewed in that particular survey using different households said that they don't have confidence in the IEC. And you cannot discredit this because these are scientific research that is being surveys that are being conducted. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So we use it even though there is, um, in research, we have the problem of um, generalization sometimes. But when surveys are conducted, we use it to generalize, to say this is the opinions of the people at the end of the day. I mean, he's always having problem with the people, but the Gambians, the electorate. <laughs> when we say, you, know, you see, when we say, when we say the people in democracy, yeah. in a democracy, when you say democracy, people rule. There are two things that come, questions that, bear, that, are, that come to mind. Who are the people and how do should they rule? Mm -hmm. So when we say the people in a democracy, mm -hmm. this refers to the electorates, the people who have the right to vote and be voted for, or the right to vote. Because in Gambia, 18 years you can vote, but you cannot be voted for, for instance, as a parliamentarian or as a president. But these are the people who can participate in elections. So when we say the people here, we're referring to mm -hmm. 18 above. above. And I think the surveys, when they were doing this also, 
they put into consideration the age category, not to take people that are not eligible to vote, but instead those that are eligible to vote. So th th these are the people here, when we say in a democracy, and context here, these are the ones that we are referring to. For me, for me, the people are the majority. Yeah, that's it. Right? Yeah. The, the, it's 9%. Mm -hmm. For me, these are the people. <laughs> that came out. Not the 10%. Okay, Mr. Khan, now we are into its campaign period. And IEC, like I said, you are the regulators. What is IEC doing? to make sure uh, people are following their itineraries, there are no issues out there, because this is important. Um, I, I've said this, uh, people fighting is not just election violence. Everything that happens pre and after elections is very important. What is IEC doing uh, when people petition? How does IEC handle it? I see a petition, I think that was filed, if I'm right, by the um, GDC uh, candidate in Jimara. Jimara. Have IEC received this, and what are you doing when it comes to things like that? And do you have things like that generally during um, campaigns, especially this period? Yes, yeah, sometimes we have uh, uh, we have uh, people we have complaints. I would say complaints in this case that somebody may complain about this or that very well. But normally we, we have uh, mechanisms of addressing those those uh, those kind of complaints uh, from candidates or from even the public. Uh, and again, uh, when we talk about uh, the, the process, the campaign process, mm -hmm. making so that the candidates they abide by the, the regulations or the rules of the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, I would say uh, the issue of engagement is key. Engaging with the public, engaging with the electorate, engaging with the candidates and all other stakeholders, such that they are fully aware what each stakeholder's uh, expectations are and what are their obligations. Mm -hmm and their responsibilities in the process. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, of course, here we're talking about the candidates. I think here they are the primary stakeholders here mm -hmm. because they are the people who are up on, uh, um, out there running for, uh, to be elected uh, for the National Assembly. And when we, uh, the commission uh, is even law that they had to subscribe to the Code of Campaign Ethics, mm -hmm. which is a legal framework that uh, provides uh, guidance as to how to conduct a peaceful campaign uh, during the e um, election period. So, of course, the, all the candidates, of course, is a, is a precondition to nomination. to nomination. So they have to subscribe to it. They did. Okay. So now uh, it comes to the issue of enforcement yeah. or monitoring, I would say. Monitoring. Like the, the commission uh, appointed uh, seven running officers across the country, one each in each of the regions, and who are in charge of the, the various uh, elections uh, in all the 53 constituencies. So Gambia would be doing elections for the 53 constituencies uh, to the National Assembly. So the general officers have each uh, an, a, a region uh, to supervise, and they are really doing that. And when it comes to the monitoring aspect of it or the uh, enforcement aspect of it, that candidates are expected to comply with the code of conduct, which, of course, uh, uh, bars people from uh, making inflammatory mm -hmm. uh, statements mm -hmm. against uh, other candidates, or also people inciting violence, mm -hmm. or people inciting uh, religious uh, sentiments mm -hmm. uh, during the campaign, or even tribal sentiments, mm -hmm. regional sentiments. I think these are issues that this code of campaign ethics have really, you know, barred uh, from happening during the campaign process, making so that uh, it's purely a Gambian issue. Uh, Gambians uh, are engaged in the process and that uh, the issue of tribe, the issue of religion must never surface uh, during the campaign process. So that you, the candidates are expected you know, to canvass for votes from the electorate. That is uh, telling them their agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, what plans or why do you think that the voters have to vote for you, vote for you. and not the others? Yeah, you, you talk so, about something, okay, you yeah, can complete. Just to regulate the process, yeah. making sure that it is fair it is transparent mm -hmm. and also it is peaceful. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the question, uh, because you mentioned um, 53 constituencies where elections will be conducted. Mm -hmm. Just on the newspaper, I think it was yesterday or today, um, I realized that your office is working on modalities to mm -hmm. see how there's elections the because yeah. Yeah. of the displaced voters there. Yeah. That's very. So I want to know what is the level of, you know, Preparedness, preparedness for Pony. Are they going? Are they not going to vote in April, April 9th? Well, I hope they will vote in these elections. Actually, today we have a when team. Do you say I hope. I hope. Yeah, I hope. I hope. Yeah. It depends. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Because today we had a secure a, a team deployed uh, to that Pony region uh, that went on an assessment mission. 
in order to assess, uh, because we have some um, uh, polling stations which are very close to the border. Mm -hmm. uh, the like Kankurang Island, uh, Kanilai, and some of those villages which are uh, very close to the border. And of course, we had a huge number of people who have been displaced uh, from those areas. Exactly. So right now, the commission is, is consulting with the stakeholders. In this case, I would say security. Mm -hmm. uh, because security, uh, they, they, they are lead uh, stakeholders in this uh, aspect that they will assess how secure the place is and also uh, whether people can be able to participate in the election. Yes. So I'm sure pretty soon the commission would come uh, and take a, uh, and do a statement in, in, that, in that regard. In the event, Esa, that happens, they are not able to vote. Um, what happens? The entire election process cancels or just that region will not vote? What how yes, it depends. I know it affects uh, three constituencies. Yeah. Uh, Fony Bintang, I think Fony Benefit and Fony Kansala. 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 Yeah, those uh, three constituencies along the Kasamans uh, Gambia border. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and not of course, not all the villages, huh? just some of the sort of settlements mm -hmm. along the border. Mm -hmm. These are those uh, which are affected. So, I would not want to preempt uh, the, the findings of, uh, of, the, of the team deployed, mm -hmm. but I hope uh, the Commission will, of course, uh, engage partners, the security in this case, the Gambia Police Force, uh, for, for advice on the issue. Whether it is safe and secure to conduct elections in those areas, and if not, maybe the Commission can devise other means. Other, other means. Yes, I was thinking maybe of Maybe even to relocate police relocate stations. Police stations, yeah. exactly. I was thinking of that. From areas. those areas. Yes. So these are those that are displaced, because some of them probably they are in the combos or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And as long as they are registered in those constituencies, mm -hmm. the Commission can devise, you know, mechanisms to make sure that they are, they, they got to those polling stations that are that are available in different communities or settlements. Yes. For them to go on. It will require resources. A lot of logistics, I would say. Not and I don't, I don't think that will come from the voters themselves. Maybe the commission will have to see how best to Yeah, this is what I'm saying. I don't want to preempt. Pre yeah. Yeah. So right now, the, the team is, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, on the ground uh, in, in Fony. So I don't want to preempt their work. Uh, I'm sure the commission will, will come up with something mm -hmm. how to uh, resolve some of those issues. Yeah. Apart from the what are the other issues that right now the IEC is faced with when it comes to this current cycle of election? I would say is things are going very well for now. Very well. The campaign is ongoing smoothly, uh, uh, thanks to the majority of the candidates. Mm -hmm. Because I'm so Gambia, you know, things are growing, people are growing, mm -hmm. and there is uh, an increased level of political maturity and awareness. Of course, we see in candidates, uh, they normally come together um, as a team, even though, you know, they are contesting candidates. So they would draw uh, their campaign attendance as a team. And I wish you are in there. There is a lot of collaboration and cooperation among themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think this is high maturity. Mm -hmm. There's at even a point, um, one candidate will even help the other in drawing his or her campaign itinerary. Oh. I think this is what we expect. Mm -hmm. This is Gambia. It's one Gambia, one people. Mm -hmm. So even though uh, it's election, people are contesting. But again, the choice comes from the people. Yeah. So I think all that the candidate can do is to talk to the people, appeal to the people for votes. And then the decision lies with the people. Here, when I say the people, I mean the, <laughs> the, the, people. the majority. The majority. The majority of <laughs> Gambia. Exactly. <laughs> Talk with this, the people. Yeah, the right? people. <laughs> but then, Esa, one thing we have also seen, like we were talking about the number of candidates that are aspiring mm -hmm. to run for office, but significantly, mm -hmm. the women. We have seen about 19, 19 women. women. It's minimal, running. huh? I mean... The figures have increased, yeah. but it's not impressive. Looking at time and space, it's not impressive. But I say looking at time but and space. Looking at where, when, where we came from. Yeah, the last election, how many women contested? Five, uh, five, about five, five from five, five to so. nineteen. Yeah, but but that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The figures have improved. Yes. But looking at time and space, it is not an impressive one. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 21st century. Yeah. We're talking about you know dictatorship ended since 2016. We're talking about the political space being liberalized. We're saying that women participation in politics and governance will be enhanced by this level. But now we're talking about only 19 out of 251 candidates. Yeah. That is very minimal. And it's minimal, I think. So, so it's, it's not impressive for me. The figures have increased, have improved, yes. But time and space, it is not impressive. Mm. And if you look at most of because last election, I think it was only three women that were elected. Mm, just 
was it two? Three, no, three. Banjul Sao, Talinding, and Fonyi. And Fonyi. Three of them were elected, and only three were nominated by the president. So five women in parliament altogether. And we say now, at least, I am saying, that is why the constitutional amendment bill that was stalled in parliament, you, you realize that, I mean, it's a setback, a major setback when it comes to women participation in politics. Because, and that is why I always say, Father, I always go back to this, to say yeah. that it is a failure that we still don't have a new constitution in place. Mm -hmm. The new constitution was going to address that, yeah. a quota system. Do you understand? So, but it's, it's not only about it. That's why I said the part, next parliamentarians should make sure that there is a new constitution. But there are some of these provisions that are what we call affirmative action or positive discrimination. That will create a quota system to say women must be allocated certain seats in parliament. Because, you see, it's not a law for political parties to so come up with a certain number of women. It's not a law. No. So that, those are mechanisms. But then they have a role to play. Yeah, that's what I'm ever. saying. They have a role to oh, play. Look at, look I, at I was just coming to that. Okay. To say they have a role to play. Yeah. To make sure that they open the political system. I think, I think the women that are contesting, UDP is for UDP is five. Two? Five? UDP is five. Okay. NPP is three. Okay. Uh, DOI, uh, UDP is six. I have the numbers. NPP is three. I think DOI is one. And yeah, all the rest are what, zero. So, so, women, so, yeah. so political parties must create that platform. Mm -hmm. They must create that system, that internal democracy, that affirmative action of positive discrimination. UDP within. is six. Okay. NPP is three. DOI is three. In the three independent. APRC one. NUP one. CA one. And GFA one. Exactly. So you realize that the political parties must create that, that, that opportunity for women within their parties. And then it moves. But then when we are able to have this in our laws, to create that quota system, mm -hmm. it will be able to enhance women participation because political parties will be compelled to, you know, put up women candidates because at the end of the day, you know that there are a certain number of seats or percentage of seats allocated for women in parliament. It's not only women, but look at the differently able people. Yeah, yeah, the only one the person, only yeah, one, one two. And that's, no, that's independent. Right? Independent. Right. No, that's I think it's two. I was told it's two. One no, UDP and one independent. No, it's one. One. I, one no, independent. I, in the okay, fine, fine. In San Emente. San Emente. Yeah, You're talking about Sanimente. only one differently able person. Yeah. Uh, and contesting. it's independent. It's independent. And it's, it's independent. Even a party back, yeah. Exactly. And it's independent. Mm -hmm. So you realize that our, that is why I said our laws still have problems. When I say our laws still have problems, it's not about the IEC not doing this, yeah. this, the I'm saying that we need so, reforms. Uh, Forms. Okay, and those reforms are going to create opportunity for vulnerable groups, marginalized groups in society, women, differently able people, but even the, young even people, the youth, yeah. the youth. even the youths. We're talking about youth participation, youth participation, youth participation, youth people. But the laws are not there. The frameworks are not available. We must be able to reform those laws, existing laws, to make sure that it cater for these people, so that they come and participate, but effectively in politics. So when it comes to women participation, I think there are a lot of things, factors responsible. Looking at the patriarchal nature of our society, mm -hmm. sometimes when women want to candidate, mm -hmm. the first thing they question whether she is married. Yeah. That is one thing. Mm -hmm. Your dress code. Yeah. Okay. I mean, how do you comport yourself in society here and there? I mean, and when men are coming, we don't look at that. And we've seen in parliament, the, par the, the last parliament, um, I've, I've seen two women have been very impressive mm -hmm. in parliament. Yeah, Kumba yeah, Jete and Kumba Jai. Yeah. This was very impressive. They were contributing effectively than most of the men in, in, men in that parliament. Yeah. Apart from veteran Halifa Sala and Sidi Ajata, who will you mention that were contributing effectively to debate uh, more than these two women in parliament? Yeah. None. None. I, cannot, I cannot point out any. Do you understand? So it's, it's not about your gender. For me, it's about the competence of the individual. And when we say the competence, women also must also realize that, oh, when we say women should participate here and there, we don't also uh, call him for any woman. As long as we're not calling for any man, and as much as we're not calling for any man to come, whether you have the competence or not, but it's not also about any woman. Just because we want women to participate, any woman can just come. We're talking about women that are disgracing us in parliament and other institutions. Just like men are disgracing us. When we talk about young people too, it's not for every Tom Dick and Harry to come. Yeah. It's about competence. We're looking at competence by virtue of your gender. But what we are also interested in, we know that we have a society where patriarchy is entrenched, where women are disadvantaged when it comes to governance and politics. So what we need is that they must be able to participate. And how do they participate? The laws must be reformed. The legal frameworks must be broadened. They must be reformed to suit all these groups in society, especially those that are vulnerable, three of them, women, 
differently able people and also young people. I think the affirmative action that we need, as far as our laws are concerned, will address these groups of people. I have said this several times. Um, there are so many people that contributed to the failure of this, um, the, the draft. Mm. Parliamentarians, government politicians, mm. you name it. Mm. But I believe the, so the civil society also have a big role to play mm -hmm. in election processes and yeah. things like that. And looking at what is happening even right now, I don't see anything that the civil society is doing right now mm. complementing the efforts of the IEC when it comes to voter education, when it comes to awareness, you know, talking about the role of parliament. Because all the things that you listed here, mm. these are the day-to-day -day running of our homes, mm. our budget, what goes to the farmers, what goes to the healthcare, what goes to every other thing. Mm. If the caliber of parliamentarians we are looking at now is what goes to parliament, it affects all of us. But what role is the civil society playing right now to talk to the electorate? So I know that sometimes when you, you go out there and talk, people say, oh, politician, I'm going to key. But at some point, I can proudly sit here and say, I want Yakumba back at the National Assembly because I know she's going to deliver. I want Tumanjai back there because I've seen them participate. But people will be scared to say some of these things because they don't want those people there because they think, um, if you say you're that, gonna, people will say, ah, feel a boka, feel a boka. Sometimes you're going to have to, I see somewhere Femi was saying, oh, the UDP, <laughs> what did he say? Political scientist. Political scientist. <laughs> well, but sometimes you have to accept those things for you to be able to say what you believe is you see, right. You see, you see what, one thing. That civil is what society, is, keep quiet. That is, that is what, before I come to the civil Madre society. The, yeah, before I come to civil society, when you talk about, I mean, especially those of us in academia, yeah. and sometimes, you know, people think that, oh, when you're talking, it should just be this, don't be seen this, don't be seen that. It's not about you sewing your color or whatever, but there is one thing, there is one concept that I want Gambians to understand. We have academics or scholars, but mm. there is also what we call scholar activism. We have scholar activists. These are scholars or academics who are not only, who don't confine themselves to only, I mean, analyzing issues as they come, mm -hmm. but they step beyond that. They go beyond that mm -hmm. to fight for the vulnerable, to speak out the truth, to say things that are wrong and to say things that are right. So in, in that, they form an opinion. They don't only analyze things as they come to them, but they also form opinions about, about issues. So that is one thing that people have to understand. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to civil society, for instance, so it's not bad for people to say, I want competent people like Tumanjai, I want competent people like um, Sidi Ajata to be back in parliament here yeah. and there. I, I, and if you look at these candidates, they are very disadvantaged right now. Sidiya, I think, is disadvantaged. Yeah. Sorry to say. Yeah. Tumanja is disadvantaged. Sorry Yakuma to say. Is. We know incumbents always sweep Banjul. I mean, equally, um, Yakumba might be disadvantaged as well. Even though they, ca they might be able to win elections. I'm not saying that they are losing elections. But you look at a lot of things. A lot of factors contribute to all these things. And if we t lose these people in parliament, not having Khalifa there anymore, Losing Syria, losing Tuma, losing Yakumba. I mean, what kind of parliament? Unless we have new breed of parliamentarians coming, I don't know some, some of them. Maybe some of them can, can, can replace these people. But, so if you come to the, when it comes to the civil society, I think, like you said, I'm also not very impressed. I'm part of civil society. Yeah. But I'm not very impressed when it comes to the participation of civil society in 2016 and 2017 compared to now. I don't know what is responsible because 2016 elections, up towards the election, mm -hmm. civil society will be very instrumental. If you look at NYP, you know, um, peace ambassadors, these were, these were organizations that were engaged in voter education and sensitizing. When things were difficult under a dictatorship, yeah, Jamie was all over and these people were going, talking to people to come out and vote in the elections. At some point, some of them were branded as being opposition because they were asking people, they were telling people their rights, their duties, their playing that civil, civic education role. 2017 election, the same thing happened. The trend continues, and people, a lot of people you know, were able to come out, and they made even people believe that, look, don't think that it is only the barrel of the gun that can remove dictators. Your vote can remove a dictator. And that was what happened in 2016 election. So we come to 2017, the same thing happened. But now, the, as you said, the euphoria is not 2021 there. 2021 so election, it, they were really out there. They, so a lot of them were out there. But now... So you, you, and also, the 2017 election, there was one thing that we were doing. Um, there was this group called Not Too Young to Run. It yeah. was a campaign that was yeah, on. Yeah. And they were able to get a lot of young people to come. And so interesting, so that they at least educate them on the role of parliamentarians. And there, I attended some of those trainings. But then, what happened also was that I think they were a bit disappointed. Um, those that most of those that they, that they supported could not win elections. 
um, at the end of the day, you know, they went with only few people in parliament. And some of them, they, they were betrayed by some of those people who, you know, instead of, you know, pursuing their course, decided to go their own way. I mean, I will say whether they cross capitated in parliament or whatever. So, so it was kind of, um, and then this year what we expect also maybe, it's not about not too young to run. But they could, there could be a combination, looking at women, 19 women coming up. But what can civil society do to, to make, make sure, sure that these, these things are pushed, to make sure that women, to women are pushed to, to that to level? To, to, exactly, to mm. win elections. Because most of the time, civil society is they are afraid. Like you said, when they talk a lot, people will say, oh, you're you are part of this, they'll yeah. be branded. But you don't have to Actually care about point, that. You have I always to. tell them that mm. civil society can even talk to politicians. If you know that, okay, the laws are not there yet. The quota system is not yet there. So you cannot go and say, women must have this seat in parliament. But you can engage political parties. Talk to them. Let them make sure that they put a good number of candidates, women candidates. If, for instance, today, we say in Banjul North constituency, NPP puts up women candidates, UDP women candidates, um, all the parties will have women candidates, nobody will have a choice, nobody will have an option to say, no, 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 I will vote for a man. Because you only vote for a man when a man is there. Yeah. Only women candidates. At the end of the day, they must be in parliament. Yeah, yeah. So political parties must be engaged. They themselves must realize their role in political socialization, in political culture. To have a matured political culture, we always say, the agents of political socialization, there's the home, the school, you know, um, but political parties are also agents of political socialization. That is to make sure that people build that, the, because when you say political culture, we're referring to the attitude, the behavior of people in a politi particular political system. So the mindset of the people um, is that, okay, women cannot represent us better. Women cannot be in positions here and there. How do we change that? It's not only the media. It's not only the IEC. It's not only the NCCE. It's not only civil society. But political parties themselves have a role to play in that. And civil society can engage political parties. I've said this in a forum where civil society present. I said, what we can do, don't always think that, oh, it's only the laws that can be there. At the end of the day, we sit and blame IEC, we blame parliamentarians, the laws are not there here and there. But what are we doing at our level to engage these political parties? It's not only about creating not too young to run campaign or whatsoever campaign, but also engaging these political parties. Because if you look at that not too young to run campaign, it was only targeting individual candidates. Now, you cannot come and target an individual candidate from a political party without the political party being aware of it, mm. that this is what we want. So civil society must engage those political parties, parties to tell them that, you know what we want? Put up a certain number of women, put up a certain number of youth in these constituencies here and there, especially where you know there's a good demographic group, um, maybe women or youth in this particular constituency. We're talking about the, high, the highest number of, if you look at this past election, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think women participated more than, than men. Yes. And also even young people, a lot of voter talk, young, young people came and participated. Yeah. So if we have these people contributing, like you said, the people, the, the majority, the majority, the majority <laughs> the women and the young people are the majority, the majority here. Yeah. At the end yeah, of the yeah, day, yeah. they are marginalized. We are not giving them the voice that they deserve. Yeah. So you realize that political part, civil society must engage political parties to create these opportunity avenues for women and young people so that they can participate. But without that, it's going to be very difficult. And we will keep on blaming different stakeholders without blaming ourselves. Yes, so we have a role to play as civil society. We have well. a role to play. Finally, Mr. Khan, I know we're running out of time. You want to say something before? Yes, just to add to Essa, mm -hmm. that I think we should be aware of this factor of the diminishing curve. That uh, normally there is a lot of euphoria, a lot of participation, when it comes to the presidential election. Yeah. Yes. But then we normally see uh, a, a drop in this curve, Parliament. you know, as elections, you know, uh, are proceeding. Maybe we should know, do research exactly on that. Somebody should do research should. on that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When it comes to presidential election, I think everybody, you know, is, is interested. Yeah. Then we see, you normally see, usually we see a drop in this, come National Assembly elections. Then we also see a drop in this, come local government local elections. Government. So yeah. this is why I'm saying this is the diminishing curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, is But what do we need to do to address that? Because the, 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 the importance of the National Assembly should, should is, 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 is cannot be emphasized. That is one thing I know, as I mentioned about the budget, I think this could be a factor. Yeah that normally most uh, uh, stakeholders, mm -hmm. they're very interested. So the people have, uh, or institutions have more resources come uh, presidential elections. And we normally see a drop, you know, in funding, you know, in, 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 in subsequent elections. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I Those hope uh, this can be a factor. factor. Like right now, you talk about the CSOs. I believe that most of the CSOs, they have a drop in funding, yeah. you know, come national assembly. So as such, they cannot be, but it's really visible, you know, like now as the president election. Yeah. Okay. 
And finally, uh, before we go, I know one of the constraints, uh, one of the issues raised by even um, the EU and other partners is the capacity level of the IEC. Going into this election, um, how is that? How is that? The legal, the legal angles. Yeah, I mean, legal. I know there's a case that's going to court, and we don't want to talk about it very well. Very well, yeah. but um, the, the capacity of IEC. A lot of people question that. Even the international partners, the EU report cited that very, very well. What is what? What has been? What has improved since the presidential election? Very well. I think a lot of a lot of things improved from the presidential. And again, I think people are talking about EU, EU, EU. Why but EU? Even, Is it because they are too up? No. <laughs> no. No, but uh, let, we let just me, also mentioned that me, even our people, the people. Uh, let me say that there are a lot of uh, observers, many of them, mm -hmm. some from African countries, uh, most of them, in the, I think, I was, there was only one to up uh, observer group, mm -hmm. that, that's the EU. Mm -hmm. So most, and they did valid recommendations. Mm -hmm. One was uh, the ECOWAS, the African Union. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the elders, uh, maybe they are half to bab. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will come. <laughs> maybe they are half to bab. So let's talk about our own African, our own national you know, observers. Yeah. They, they make uh, very good recommendations and we really uh, are working uh, towards that. And some, but, some but, of them but Mr. Can if you say we talk about our local, they make good recommendations. Is it that because those people said what you want mm, and the EU did not say what you want? <laughs> not necessarily. If it was the other way around. <laughs> not necessarily. I think uh, we, we only always believe in you know having fair play, right? Yeah. Yes. When we talk about one, we we, we not give them prominence, right? Because they are too bad, right? No, you know? not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> I think, of course, very well. They also did some recommendations that we, we really welcome. Yeah. Okay. In terms of capacity, you know, and also in in terms of uh, uh, the structure, you know, and in terms of the gaps in the laws. But let's note that uh, some of those issues are beyond the reach of the commission. These are outside the domain of the commission. Mm -hmm. As I would always say, the IEC is not a, a law-making body. Mm -hmm. It's a law-implementing body. Mm -hmm. So let's take note that some of those recommendations, they pertain to issues of law, mm -hmm. which is outside the problem. IEC is not supposed to uh, translate the law, right? Yeah. IEC don't have that mandate. Uh -huh. IEC I don't want to bring that conversation. <laughs> IEC <laughs> only implements <laughs> implement the law. law yes. <laughs> The law says, put, the, put this bottle here, uh -huh. we put it there. Full stop. Full stop. Okay? So we know there are other uh, institutions that, that are responsible for uh, making laws. That's the National Assembly. And also when it comes to interpretation, we never did and we will never do so. So that's <laughs> also another body. That's the courts. The courts. So we won't go that far. So dealing with the recommendations, I think uh, people should, would have seen you know, some changes during this cycle. For example, the nomination process was one of them. That people, and again, this was also ba based on you know the court rulings, huh? judicial uh, precedents. Huh? I think we are setting precedents here. Mm. And that uh, in terms of the uh, nomination process, uh, people who submitted the admission papers and they had some faults with them, they were told on the spot that please go and correct A, B, or C. So I think this were some of the some of the improvement that we did. And uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, capacity, uh, does the, the structural adjustments within the IEC, the, 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 uh, the various uh, arms of the IEC or the departments, I think that's also maybe outside the, uh, the powers of IEC, right? Maybe the Minister of Finance to give us more budget well, huh? yeah. uh, to get true. a legal department. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, well, I'm sure... Why are you requesting for it? Is it, was it department. part of your budget? Because that's, that's the requirement that IEC should even not even negotiate. That should be there. Because you are implementing very law. Very well, very well. By law, IEC's budget cannot be touched by even the president. Yeah. Okay? But sometimes we go to the National Assembly, they judge our budget. There is nothing we can do about it. So sometimes I think people have to appreciate that we have some constraints. Okay? As per the law, IEC does the budget, give it to the president who can only make a comment. And he cannot even change anything. Then submit to the parliament for approval. But this is not happening. As Mr. Njai said, I think the laws, I think, we have a lot of gaps in the laws. Huh? So, um, so subsequently, as, in we, as a country, we should be looking in that direction. Yeah. Harmonizing the laws and also uh, making them as relevant, you know, and as current as and, 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 and that, that brings me to the point of, um, like you said, there are a lot of gaps in the laws. The IEC is not a... It's not an interpretation body. Mm -hmm. It only, I mean, um, implement the laws or enforce the laws. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to, that is a problem that we, because I remember in 20, 
20, I think, um, the Nyamina West by elections, was it November 2020 or so? About yeah, yeah, the Nyamina West by election, um, the, can one of the, the GDC candidate complained that um, the NPP candidate was campaigning outside the scheduled campaign period. So we normally have some of those things, so those complaints when they come. Yeah. And so it seems like the IEC's hand is a bit tight, mm -hmm. because when people complain about that, what can the IEC do? about those things very well so legally they find it difficult they only complain to them they will say okay we noted it and we talk to them but they cannot take any further action based on law very well uh, even the media the care fighters huh? yeah I, I think uh -huh. no 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 not you guys uh -huh. not us not you no not, no, you. not us uh, i know <laughs> sometimes you know we flout the rules yeah and like there's nothing you know in the law that i uh, can do like we've seen these some of these media houses Airing political broadcast yeah, the day before election, they, which is wrong, which is wrong, yeah, which is wrong, and there is nothing on that on the, on the law. What we can do is just to talk to them, exactly, and that's why yeah. I said that is a gap in the law. It does a gap. That there, is, there should be something that the IEC should that be able do. to do, and that is that brings us to the, the point. Mr. You yeah, need a legal department. You, but you, also you need a legal department. Very well. You need a legal department. As much as we need reforms in the laws, but, but you also need a legal department. Proper legal department. Very well. We, we need it. So tell parents to give give us the okay. force. <laughs> 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 I'm sure they're watching. Uh, finally, um, I know I don't want to talk about the substantive case of Sabali, but if if the court says uh, Sabali can run, will the IEC be able to provide the logistics and everything? For him to be on the ballot at this point, hundred percent, we can do that. Let me just say say this thing, mm -hmm. uh, like you know, when we budgeting, mm -hmm. the commission budgets based on the number of political parties, yeah. and of course it will add a certain percentage, you know, to cater for whatever. Ever. So the twenty twenty one, the IEC budgeted for over eighteen mm -hmm. candidates. We budgeted for over eighteen candidates, and, six, and, uh, and, and guess what? We only had how much? Six. six. Yeah. So it means we have a huge surplus okay. of resources lying out there. So and currently, I think uh, the most we are seeing within the constituency is eight mm. per constituency. Yeah. So I would say still we have a huge surplus of resources available. Uh, like we will say, the commission is a very law-abiding institution. Uh, in 2021, it says, hey, give chance to a CA. We did. We give them a chance, even though they couldn't fulfill again. <laughs> He said, hey, give chance to GMC. GMC. We give them a chance. And again, they couldn't even fulfill. So the same thing come around. If, such, if, he, if the court says, yes, somebody must run, why not? So he will be on the ballot for sure, 100%. 100%. Final message to the viewers. Well, just to reiterate, my, my point that parliament is, parliamentary election is a very important election, and um, people must take it with seriousness and understand that this is an important institution um, within the state, and they have to come out and, and, and participate. But then also, people must also, parliamentarians out there, aspirants, let me say aspirants out there that are looking forward to be in parliament, must also understand their, their, their roles and duties, primarily, um, which is lawmaking. But uh, the politics of deception um, that, is, that is going on, I think that has to end. But then, my message to the electorates out there, let's look for competence. Um, we, are, we, are, we are at a critical juncture. Gambia is at crossroads. Um, we need parliamentarians that are com competent enough that can move this country. Um, all the reforms that we need in this country to move this country to another level um, can only happen when we have competent people in parliament. So people must take it seriously. People must take it seriously. Mr. Grant, final message to the people. To the people. <laughs> the elected. That please, please, uh, it's election time and we have the choice to make. Yeah. So as Gambians and as voters, uh, we urge them all to come out on the 9th of April 2021, 2022 from 8 o'clock uh, to 5 o'clock to choose the candidates of their choice. The Falcon is Ramadan. It's Ramadan very well. And again, that's the law. <laughs> <laughs> the law says do it. People after, are hungry. Do you think uh, people uh, will want uh, to come and stand under the hot sun? Thank you. Will yes. there be? I mean, I mean that. I don't know the uh, the, Jew, uh, the Jobans and the, the, out the there. Giants, the giants. Uh, <laughs> the giants. Know. Yes, very well. So I'm sure we improving uh, and we did one part of our training and we'll do another one uh, by next week. So we'll uh, encourage our staff to to expedite the process. You know, giants. I know they cannot queue uh, for, <laughs> for, for, for for a couple of hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the issue of speed would be buttressed during those trainings. Okay. That, hey, people are hungry, please, please, you know, hurry up. At least you come quick at the polling station, vote quickly, and go back. Just again to uh, urge people to come out early. Like it happened in Sukuta. People just, maybe by coincidence, they all came out, most of them came by 4.30. Mm -hmm. 
or four o'clock, just an hour or, or 30 minutes before closing the polls. And they had to end up voting till around midnight. And they have to vote because the law says that once they are on the queue, once they, they are in by five, you yeah. have to vote. Mm -hmm. So I think let's please uh, avoid these scenarios. Uh, it's rather than time, as the Giants, the Giants <laughs> have just said. Let's uh, come out early. Uh, and as for IEC, we'll try to expedite the process so that uh, people spend minimal time voting. Maybe after the show, when you have your... Um, when you have your morning meal and make sure you, <laughs> you and make sure out. when we are also reporting um announcing the results you let the chairman come on Ndogu. time Ndogu. we see very cold very well so we <laughs> hope to make improvements yeah. actually in the process making sure that you know, the election is uh, conducted accordingly the election is co the elections are conducted freely mm -hmm. and also in a very transparent manner as we usually do and again, the issue of speed, and so we'll uh, we'll adjust making sure that. I think uh, we'll we'll need to have the IEC back here. A lot of things are. Yes, we'll go. We'll things. definitely <laughs> drag him. <laughs> Nowadays, you have to drag Mr. Yeah. Khan to the platform. <laughs> Nowadays, you have to. But uh, thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Ken, Esther, and the, to the entire technical team. Uh, we'll be back next week, inshallah. Good night to you all. Bye bye. See you next Better week. Better and stronger as the sole ground operator at the Banjul International Airport. With an expansion in travel services, customers are assured of GIA's capacity to cater for all their travel needs, provided by professional, experienced and ever-smiling staff. GIA's Hajj package and services, by far the best in the country, give the customers the opportunity for a memorable Hajj experience. For a more efficient cargo services, GIA means business as it launches its new multi-million dollar ultra-modern cargo complex to revitalize and stimulate air transport. GIA, the pride of the Gambia. Every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon to make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets, with a liberal air transportation policy, that daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators, and for a highly ranked tourist destination, the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, operate and manage BIA technical requirements, merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. We go beyond daily.